Hello, everybody, and welcome back to The Human Perspective. Today, I'm really very happy that we're going to be talking with Kathy Martinez. Kathy and I go back, oh, probably more years than we want to say. But um, the reason I wanted to ask her to be on this program is because you'll see she has done great work in her life and continues to do so. And so I want us to learn from her about who she is, what she's been doing, and what she sees as some of the areas that we need to continue to work in. So welcome, Kathy. I'll give you my image description for today. Um, I'm wearing a blouse from Mexico, uh, which is very colorful. It's uh, white with uh, red stripes across the shoulders and down and on the uh, shoulders themselves. And I'm wearing dark colored glasses. Um, and we're in the foyer again. And so we have the same photos on the wall and dining room table and plants. Hi, Kathy. Hi, Judy, and thanks for having me on the show. Yes, I am an aging Latina woman with dark hair, uh, which is getting more gray as we speak. Um, I am wearing a silver necklace and a grape purple sweater. And my background is blurred. Right. Kathy, when did we first meet? Do you remember? We met in October of 1979. 19, and what were circumstances that we met? We met when we were organizing a rally. Um, we met at the Organization for the Rights of Disabled People in Berkeley. It was a rally led by Kitty Cohn. She was the organizer. We had lots of support from uh, the unions, um, Glide Memorial Church, uh, different uh, social justice organizations from the African-American, Latino, and LGBTQ communities. It was like three months after I got to the Bay Area, uh, officially. Where are you from, Kathy? Uh, I'm from Southern California. My family is originally from Northern New Mexico. Let's talk a little bit more about your background. So you come from uh, New Mexico. How big is your family? So I come from a pretty large Latino family by these standards. I'm, I'm one of six kids. Uh, I also have a blind sister uh, and we happen to be the two middle children of six. Both of my parents come from large families. So we were lucky to have cousins on both sides um, that were very close to us. And um, played a big role in, in me growing up, as well as did my siblings. Yeah, so maybe we could talk about that a little. Um, what year were you born? I was born in 1958. So the reason I asked that question is I was born in 1947. And it's important to realize when some of the major laws came into being. So Kathy was born in 1958, started going to school in 1962 or 1963, Section 504 came into being in 1973, and the IDEA um, not until 1975. So Kathy, what was it like for your family, your mom, your dad, um, as you were growing up and as you and your sister were identified as being blind? Did they have any experience um, in the area of blindness or disability in general? So my parents came from a relatively undeveloped part of, um, of the country at the time. They, they, ended, they did move from California, uh, they moved to California before I was born. Um, they had absolutely no experience with disability, except for, you know, with, with dealing with older relatives. And when they, you know, when I was born, they didn't really realize I was blind until I was almost, uh, you know, eight months or nine months old. Um, they didn't have a lot of experience with doctors or with the medical industrial complex. Um, and so, you know, of course, they were encouraged at the time to try to find a cure. Um, we spent a few years doing that and they realized, you know, that, that I would be blind. And then, of course, when Peggy was born two years later, um, she would be blind as well. So fortunately for us, they, they abandoned the cure idea and they focused on us, you know, having a, a decent life. In our, in our family, Peggy and I were treated 
like the rest of the kids, we were given chores, which of course we tried to get out of. You know, we were we had yeah. interactions like any other family member. Um, I felt like my parents didn't did not overprotect us. And in fact, in some ways, you know, I think they, you know, they were so afraid of overprotecting us that they, you know, they, they really kind of pushed and pushed us into situations um, that um, a lot of kids probably wouldn't have been, you know, get, like allowed to, to do. Like, um, for example, you know, we started backpacking with a Girl Scout troop when we were about 12, all the way up through high school. And um, it was a non, it was a Girl, Girl Scout troop of non-disabled girls with some amazing leaders, you know, that just taught us how to snowshoe and we went rock climbing. So we, we were lucky to get a lot of experiences that I, really helped shape us. So when it was time for your family to start thinking about you going to kindergarten, did they ever talk to you about what that was like? Yeah, so um, at the time, you know, my mom's English wasn't great. It, it, it is perfectly fine, but it wasn't great. You know, she was still coming from a Spanish speaking environment. Um, and so I say that because, um, you know, I think there was a lot of things that even that she didn't understand. I think sometimes people are a little impatient with her because her English wasn't great and she had an accent, but she did not want us to be separate. So where we lived um, in Southern California, was about 500 miles away from the School for the Blind, which at the time was in Berkeley. And my mom did not want us to go there. Um, fortunately, at the time, the California, there was some folks in California who were very interested in seeing if disabled people could be mainstreamed. And Peggy and I were some of the first blind people um, in Orange County, where we grew up, that were actually mainstream. We were not the first, but we were in the, that cohort of people um, you know, that, that went to a uh, public school. Um, and we were very well supported at the time. Um, and so, you know, my mom was very happy about that. I, I don't know if it was just timing, um, but it, it, was, it was timing, but it was also her pressuring the school district to say, I don't want to send my kid away. Um, I want her to stay here in the family, be part of our family, part of our culture, uh, and, you know, grow up with with her siblings. I think that's really important because culturally, um, as you've been describing, you have a big family and the family is important and you don't send kids away. And on the other hand, because there were no protections that she had, and as you said, there were issues around um, language, she obviously was becoming a strong advocate. Would you define yeah. your mom as a feisty woman? Yeah, for sure. She still is at 92. The other thing that I think is really important, and of course, we didn't know it at the time, but, you know, at the, w w if I had gone to a school for the blind, um, there, there's many, I'm sure there's many good things about it. But one thing that I'm grateful for is that I did not get disconnected from my culture. I think that that happened a lot um, to people of color. Um, given that the majority of teachers and administrators and um, dorm workers in segregated schools were white, except for probably the janitors. Um, and, you know, very often people would lose their culture. So I'm very grateful for that. I guess the only regret I have is I never learned how to play piano um, like Jose Feliciano and Stevie Wonder did at their schools for the blind. But, you know, what are you going to do? <laughs> So Kathy, um, when did you start learning Braille? Again, bringing people with disabilities to mainstream schools in 1963, 64, 65 was an experiment. And one of the tenets of that experiment was that we should learn Braille at the same rate that our sighted peers learned to read. So I was lucky enough to have the Braille books and I was able to participate in reading circles um, and read, you know, when they would ask people to read, I was able to read my part. Uh, and it not only did it help me be a better Braille reader, but it also taught the kids that, you know, there was another way to read and there was another way to do things. And so, you know, as a participant in those types of age appropriate activities, um, I think not only did it help me learn as a kid, but it also helped the other kids see you know, there's different ways of doing things. There's different ways of reading. There's different ways of, 
getting to a bus. You know, they were very curious and, and, um, and it was kind of woven in, you know, to the, to the classroom as just part of the, of the, of, of daily operation, so to speak. Um, so going beyond brailing, uh, what is your feeling about where we are today in the world of technology and accessibility? Well, I think we are, you know, we move, definitely move forward. We all have to realize that it's a, it's a, a marathon, not a sprint. I am very grateful for screen readers. I'm very grateful for, um, you know, gadgets like the iPhone. It's very important to remember that, you know, the people with disabilities can either be shut out or called in depending on how technology is designed. Mm -hmm. So for me, it, it's, it's, it, it's like, you know, when, when you're baking a blueberry muffin and you're, you're, you don't wait and add the blueberries till the end of the breaking process, right? You, you weave them, you, you stir them in. And so when you think about accessibility um, as Apple has, um, and they have decided as, a, as a, a standard operating practice to make every piece of technology that they design and develop accessible. So my goal, my hope, um, is that as companies, as technology companies, all companies that use technology design and develop their technology, they weave accessibility in, like, a blue, like the blueberry muffin analogy, right? And for me, you know, one of the values, I think, of doing it as you're discussing is that people who may not consider themselves to have a disability but could benefit from some of what I think more of us are talking about universal design, that it would begin to open up a new world for people who really need to benefit from some of these technologies, but we will not be going to a disability organization for whatever reason. I, I think just weaving accessibility practices at all levels, including technology, but being mindful that people don't communicate in the same ways. Um, being mm -hmm. mindful about how people prefer to communicate. And I don't even, I'm not even talking about if you're blind or if you have a communication disability, but if you're neurodivergent or if you're, you know, if you're a, a mother with a kid that, you know, you need flexibility or there's so many reasons why accessibility benefits more than just those of us who are blind, deaf and wheelchair users. Um, and and I, I think that companies are, are, are understanding that. And I think, you know, the fact that we have um, this uh, uh, push to get people who, um, who are neurodivergent in our companies have really expanded our way of thinking about how to get jobs done. And what I'm talking about is like, you know, when you're giving somebody feedback, when do they prefer the feedback? Do they prefer it through text? Do they prefer it on the phone? Do they prefer it through email? Um, you know, do they prefer not to speak in meetings? In which case, how do you, um, how do you provide for them to, uh, a way for them to participate? So I think we, we're moving, honestly, the, the thinking is moving way beyond the quote accommodations mindset and having it just woven in to the standard operating practice of the business. Now this is happening, you know, this is at the cutting edge of business. This is not happening in your average uh, workforce, but, it, but, the, but the thinking is there and it makes a lot of sense because everybody needs to be accommodated, not just people with disabilities. And I think it's so important to realize that um, everybody's, that, that accommodations for typically non-disabled people are, their accommodations, but they're just considered standard operating practice. I think for people with disabilities, you know, it's the accommodations issue has become a boogeyman. And if we, if we assume that all accommodations are productivity tools, and there's more than one way to do things that might really improve the workforce for everybody, I, I think we'll be able to hire a lot more people with disabilities um, and, and really expand the diversity of, of the workplace. Kathy, you've done many things, as you were saying earlier, uh, when you were in the Girl Scout troop um, and uh, how your parents in some way were preparing you for the bigger world. I'm wondering, as a child or as an adult, are there 
fears that you've had that you've had to overcome and how have you done that? Well, there, I'm, we're, I'm a bundle of fears, yes. but you know, you have to learn to live with them and acknowledge them. And um, in terms of fears, um, well, I think being accepted, being included. Um, one of the things I used to do as a, as, a, as a young kid is when people were talking to me, instead of looking at them, I would put my ear toward them because that's where I was listening. Uh, you know, that's where we were connecting. And the kids at school actually said, don't, don't do that. Look at somebody. Or if you, you know, put your head, put your, your face toward them. So, you know, a lot of it was like, how do, how do you fit in, in a visual world? That was, I wouldn't say it was a fear, but it was a concern. Um, and I don't know about overcoming, you know, I don't know if we ever do. Um, certainly, um, you know, as a, as a blind parent, one of my fears was, um, you know, doing, doing a, a good job um, and, and there was a while there where I was afraid that Jorge's friends, my son's friends would, would not, their parents would not allow them to come to my house. But that, you know, that, that I had many sleepovers. Um, and, you know, the thing that was so amazing about that is that the kids were very comfortable with me. The parents took a little more time to get comfortable. And one of the examples is um, um, I would have, a kid's, a kid's sleepover on Fridays, and, and then that kid's parents would um, take Jorge and their kid to soccer in Saturday morning. So the first time they stayed over, um, the, the mother came in and, you know, how did everybody do? Did everybody sleep? Yeah, we're all good. And then she, um, she whispered to the, her son, did you have breakfast? And he said, yeah, we had breakfast. And she said, what did you have? And he said, we had, you know, eggs and toast and blah, blah, blah. And then she said, how did she do it? And the kid just busted the parent, said, mom, you know, she did it just like you do. She put the eggs in the pan and, you know, and so those are the kind of, I, I did have that as a fear. You know, I wanted other, other parents to know that I would be, you know, was able to, to manage their kids. I think, you know, we all want to fit in. We all want to do well. So those were some of my fears. So for a minute, Kathy, did you go on to higher education? And what was that transition like from high school to higher ed? I did go on to higher education. However, there was a few bumps in the road, but, but it was an interesting story or a situation. So I graduated from high school, went to the Department of Rehab, said, hey, you know, here I am, I want to, you know, I want to, I want to work. They said, okay, you can be a PBX telephone operator. You can be a rehab counselor, or of course I could make rooms, right? I could work in a sheltered workshop. I said, no, nope, sorry, none of that. He said, and then like about three weeks later, he said, I have the best job for you. This is fantastic. And he really thought it was a step in the right direction because it was in a non-disabled environment. I got a job when I was 18 years old at Quickset Lock Factory, where I ran a punch press. It was a very dangerous, very dirty job. And I decided, you know, after nine months, now this isn't for me. I went back to the rehab counselor. I said, hey, I'd love to go to college. He said, sorry, your case is closed. So I thought, oh God. So after I quit Quickset, um, I decided to go back to school. And it took me 13 years to graduate from college because I just assumed that when they said my case was closed, that I couldn't ever contact rehab again to open it. So I went through college, paid for it myself. And then at the very end, like the last some two semesters, somebody said, no, re you know, it's a lot different now. There's new counselors. I moved up to the Bay Area, a lot more liberal thinking, um, I should say progressive thinking. Um, and so I did get, you know, they ultimately did pay for my last year at San Francisco State. But yes, I did graduate. It did take me 13 years. Um, I was raising a kid in the meantime and traveling and I lived in Mexico. So none of the time was wasted, but I it did, you know, I was not on the four year plan. Let me just say that. What would you say are some of your most meaningful experiences in the world of work? Oh gosh. Um, okay, I have me, many. I'm sorry, let, let me also preface this by saying, Kathy has worked both in the nonprofit sector at the level in the federal government as assistant secretary, and then moved 
over to Wells Fargo as a senior vice president, and now is the president and CEO of uh, Disability Rights Advocates. So you've really had a great array of jobs where you start as an individual working on projects and then moved up the, the chain into management. So for me, um, there's a, a few experiences that have meant the world. And one of them is, you know, being able to leave a place better than I found it. So um, when I left the Department of Labor, I felt like it was in good hands. I felt like I had done what I could do there. You know, we got Section 503 strengthened and the president established it as an executive order. Um, I felt like I had, you know, developed some some projects um, that that made a difference. Add us in was a, a project where we it kind of was a a, a, a takeoff on the Proyecto Vision work where um, we worked with uh, minority chambers of commerce um, to connect the disability community to that community where there's you know thousands and thousands of jobs. Um, so, you know, leaving, I think leaving places better than I found them, um, really kind of paying it forward, um, helping to mentor folks as much as I can. And, and then uh, on the foundation side, we really, you know, change the approach to our, to the philanthropy um, and not have it be a charity issue. But um, one of the, the pillars in our philanthropic strategy was to have, to fund organizations um, that had people with disabilities in their leadership. That was a that was something that was a must. So we changed the focus of of how we funded disability organizations. It was it became much less about charity and much more about independent living and uh, self determination. What is the guidance that you would like to give to our listeners? I mean, I guess my first thing would be stay curious, um, be a lifelong learner. Um, in terms of disability, uh, remember, bake it in, don't bolt it on. Um, it's not an afterthought. There's an amazing world out there of people with disabilities. We have an incredible culture. Stay curious, pay it forward, and believe in yourself. Yeah. Si se puede. Yes. Si se puede. Well, thank you so much, Kathy, <clears throat> for joining us today. We'll see you again. Look forward to you at our next show. Thanks, Judy. Thank you. That history won't forget us or try to minimize our pain. And so why 